Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today I am finally bringing you some AM5 motherboard content. I have a lot more of this planned. I have every single X670 slash X670 e board. So a big roundup is coming. Hopefully next week we'll see how we go. But before we get to that, I wanted to take a look at the most affordable X670 models because I found a few interesting performance related quirks in my testing. But before we get to that, Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Gigabyte and their NVIDIA GeForce RTX 30 series of graphics cards. For gamers seeking a premium experience, the Aorus range offers a number of excellent models such as the Extreme, Master and Water Force. All models include high-end coolers, either with massive triple fan heat sinks or large radiators in the case of the Water Force series. These aggressive performance focused designs ensure optimal operating temperatures and maximum power delivery. They're also very eye-catching with stunning RGB visual effects and of course with the ability to support ray tracing and DLSS, you can enjoy breathtaking in-game visuals. For our Aussie viewers, these models are also available in pre-built systems from M-Wave, PLE, Scorptech and Senecom, so for more information, please check the link in the video description. Okay, so for this one we're looking at the ASRock X670E PG Lightning, which currently costs $260, the Gigabyte X670 Gaming XAX, which should cost $280, it's not really on sale yet. And then we have the MSI Pro X670-P Wi-Fi and the ASUS Prime X670-P Wi-Fi, which both cost $290. And I should say the Gaming X, it's on sale in Australia, but availability in the US isn't great. So yeah, I'm, I'm guessing the US pricing a bit because the only boards that are listed are massively overpriced. Anyway, these are all sub $300 US motherboards, which admittedly is still very expensive, but by X670 standards, they're also relatively cheap options. Now, for those of you not yet up to speed, the E or Extreme versions of these chipsets offer more PCI Express 5.0 lanes. So the X670E motherboards provide 16 PCIe 5.0 lanes for the primary PCIe x16 slot used by the graphics card, with a further four PCIe 5.0 lanes for the primary M.2. Non-Extreme boards, so those marked as X670, only offer four PCIe 5.0 lanes, which are typically used by the primary M.2 slot, allowing for the adoption of high speed storage, while the primary PCIe x16 slot is limited to PCIe 4.0. And that's still plenty fast enough, especially given products such as the RTX 4090 still only support PCIe 4.0. In short, X670 boards are cheaper to manufacture when compared to X670E as PCIe 5.0 increases the board design complexity by requiring impeccable traces. Having said that though, it is odd that the most affordable X670 motherboard on the market right now is actually an X670E model from ASRock. Go figure. In fact, ASRock doesn't even offer a non-extreme version of their X670 motherboards. They're all X670E, so that's quite interesting. Anyway, we'll start by taking a quick look at the ASRock X670E PG Lightning. Now, given how much cheaper this model is when compared to other entry-level X670 boards from MSI, Gigabyte, and ASUS, it does look very solid. The I.O. panel is littered with USB ports. There are half a dozen 3.2 Gen 1 ports, a single 3.2 10 gigabits per second port, and one 20 gigabits per second port. There's also four USB 2 ports, 2.5 gigabit LAN, and a BIOS flashback button. The only thing missing here is Wi-Fi, but ASRock has included an M.2 key E slot for Wi-Fi, so you could add that support if need be. On board, there's an additional two USB 3.2 Gen 1 headers supporting four ports, two more USB 2.0 headers, and a front panel Type-C Gen 2 x 2 header. You also get three full-length PCIe x 16 slots. The primary slot is PCIe 5.0 x 16 connected to the CPU, with the secondary a PCIe 4.0 slot wired for x4 bandwidth. And the third is a PCIe 4.0 slot wired for x1 bandwidth. And in addition to that, there's another x1 slot. Now, powering the vCore portion of the VRM are 14 MPS 70 amp power stages, and cooling them are two basic heat sinks which extract heat from both the power stages and inductors. In general, the features and components used are of high enough quality, though the board itself doesn't exactly scream $260 US product. The Realtek ALC897 audio codec is extremely basic, the BIOS is very simple, and there's no onboard buttons such as power reset and clear CMOS and there's no diagnostic LED, which you kind of expect at this price point, but it's also by far the cheapest X670E motherboard, so there is that. 
At first glance, the Gigabyte X670 Gaming X is a much more impressive looking motherboard, though keep in mind this isn't an X670 eboard, so the primary PCIe x16 slot only supports PCI Express 4.0, not the latest 5.0 standard, but that's about the only drawback when compared to ASRock's PG Lightning. Around at the I.O. panel, you get six USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, two USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports, and a USB Type-C 20 gigabits per second port. There are also four USB 2.0 ports, and of course, a Q flash button, so a BIOS flashback type feature. Along with the wired 2.5 gigabit LAN, Gigabyte has also included Wi-Fi 6E with Bluetooth 5.2 support, though you're still only getting very basic onboard Realtek audio. Then for the VRM, the V-Core is powered by 16 Infineon Optimos 70 amp power stages, which is typically the kind of configuration you'd expect to find on an extreme high-end motherboard. So I guess the fact that we're getting this on a sub $300 US board is actually not that bad. Gigabyte has also included some huge VRM heat sinks, which are connected using a copper heat pipe. And these heat sinks extract heat from both the power stages and inductors. They've also included onboard buttons for power, reset, and CMOS, which is very nice, though the diagnostic LED display is still missing. Overall though, a solid looking X670 motherboard. Now the MSI Pro X670-P Wi-Fi, this is MSI's most affordable X670 motherboard, and at present it still costs $290 US. It certainly feels like a quality board, it's very heavy, though surprisingly there is no pre-installed I.O. shield, there's no onboard button so you don't get power reset or clear CMOS, and there's no diagnostic LED. So in that sense it is very much bare bones. That said, you are getting Wi-Fi 6E support, 2.5 gigabit LAN, and good quality onboard audio with the Realtek ALC 4080 codec. There's also four USB 3.25 gigabits per second ports, three 10 gigabits per second ports, one of which is a Type-C, and then there's another Type-C, but this one is capable of 20 gigabits per second. As you'd expect, on board there are loads of M.2s and a reasonable amount of PCI expansion. Then for the vCore VRM, we've got 16 MPS 80 amp power stages, which is again another extreme high-end VRM that you'd typically only expect to find on a flagship motherboard, but here it is on an entry-level model. The heat sinks here aren't as good as what we found on the Gigabyte Gaming X, but they're still sufficient and with such an overkill VRM, not a lot's going to be asked of them anyway. But what we do have here are two separate aluminium heat sinks that aren't connected using a heat pipe. Then we have the ASUS Prime X670P Wi-Fi, another $290 US motherboard that's very similar to the boards that we've already looked at. Again, there's no onboard buttons here, no diagnostic LED, and no pre-installed I.O. shield. The rear I.O. is very similar to the other boards that we've already looked at. There's four USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, three Gen 2 ports, and a Type-C 20 gigabits per second port. ASUS has also included Wi-Fi 6 support and 2.5 gigabit LAN, but for a board of this price point, the audio solution is very basic. Again, ASUS has gone with the Realtek ALC897 audio codec. Now, for the vCore VRM, we have a dozen Vache SIC64360 amp power stages, and ASUS is cooling them with relatively large heat sinks, similar to what we've seen with the MSI and Gigabyte boards. It might sound as though ASUS is outgunned here with just a dozen 60 amp power stages, but in the past we've seen them produce impressive results using more modest configurations than their competitors, so it'll be interesting to see how this one plays out. Other than that, the Prime X670-P Wi-Fi is a very basic looking motherboard, and in typical X670 fashion isn't quite what you'd expect to find at the $290 US price point. Okay, now that we've taken a quick look at each of these boards individually, it's time to get testing. And rather than just show you the thermal results, I've got some more traditional benchmarks, as the performance varies quite a bit between these motherboards, certainly more than you'd probably expect, and we'll get into that shortly. For testing, I'm using the Corsair IQ7000X case with the Corsair HX1000 power supply, and for cooling, the Corsair IQH170i Elite Capilex. The IQ7000X has been configured with a single rear 140mm exhaust fan and three 40mm intake fans, so the stock configuration for this case. Then in the top of the case is the H170i 420mm radiator with three 140mm exhaust fans. This is a pretty high end configuration, airflow is good, and in a 21 degree room I'd say this is an optimal setup. For recording temperatures I'm using a digital thermometer with K-type thermocouples, and I'll be reporting the peak rear PCB temperature. 
Finally, I'm not reporting Delta T over ambient, instead I maintain a room temperature of 21 degrees. And to ensure a consistent room temperature, a thermocouple is positioned next to the test system. As for the stress test, I'll be using the Ryzen 9 7950X and for load Cinebench R23, which has been looped for an hour, at which point I'm reporting the maximum PCB temperature, again recorded using K-type thermocouples. Now included in the data is the Gigabyte X670E Aorus Extreme, one of the very best X670E motherboards on the market. As you can see, these entry-level models are very similar in terms of VR and thermals. The Gaming X peaked at just 61 degrees and the ASRock PG Lightning at 63 degrees, while the ASUS Primo MSI Pro peaked at 66 degrees, which is still an exceptionally low operating temperature. Typically, we are used to seeing budget boards armed with flagship processors struggling to stay under 80 degrees, with most in the 90 to 100 degree range. So the results here with these X670 boards are excellent. With just a 10 degree difference between the Aorus Extreme and the cheapest MSI and ASUS models, it's fair to say that VRM performance is a non-issue for X670 motherboards. Still, I have tested 22 boards at this point, and I plan on releasing all of that data next week. For now though, I want to compare the actual performance of these entry-level models. What we have here is follow-up testing I conducted using the Ryzen 7 7700X with G-Skills DDR5 6000 CL30 memory and the RTX 4090. As you can see, performance is much the same with no more than a 2% deviation in score from the fastest to the slowest X670 motherboards, so really exactly what you'd expect to see. Interestingly, there is some variation in the total system power consumption with the ASUS Prime X670P Wi-Fi matching the Aorus Extreme. There are a few things that will influence these figures, such as the operating voltage, VRM efficiency, and onboard features. The Gigabyte Gaming X is clearly the most well-optimized of the entry-level boards, though, with the ASUS Prime the least optimized. Now for a quick second source, here's another productivity benchmark, Blender Open Data, and here the performance deviation is again no more than 2%. And here's a look at the typical power draw seen during the Blender test, and again, the Gigabyte Gaming X consumed the least amount of power, while the ASUS Prime was the most power hungry of the budget X670 boards. Now here's a look at the typical operating frequency recorded during the Cinebench R23 hour long test. Here the boards were very evenly matched with just a 1% frequency discrepancy between the highest and lowest clock boards. So given the Cinebench R23 and Blender results, you might expect the gaming performance to also be very similar, but it's not. Here we're seeing up to a 12% performance discrepancy between these boards, or 10% if we ignore the expensive Aorus Extreme. And it's not just Cyberpunk 2077. These sorts of margins are seen across most games. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the Gaming X was 9% faster than the MSI Pro X670-P, and 7% faster than the ASRock PG Lightning. We're also looking at a 5% difference between the fastest and slowest entry-level X670 boards in Watch Dogs Legion, with the Aorus Extreme 8% faster than the MSI Pro X670-P. So what is going on here? Because realistically, there shouldn't be more than a 1-2% to margin between the fastest and slowest boards. The reason for the varying performance is simple. The memory timings and even the UCLK, or Unified Memory Controller Clock, aren't universal across all boards even when loading AMD's Expo technology. Games are particularly sensitive to DRAM performance, whereas most productivity applications aren't, such as Cinebench and Blender, for example. The MSI Pro X670-P Wi-Fi was particularly weak in the gaming benchmarks, and that's because of the 1500 MHz UCLK. Now, apparently the default settings from AMD is a 2 to 1 ratio for the UCLK and MCLK, meaning the UCLK runs at half the frequency of the MCLK. However, ASRock, Gigabyte, and ASUS all changed the UCLK frequency to 3000 MHz when using DDR6000 memory, resulting in a 1 to 1 ratio, and this improves gaming performance as we just saw. Gigabyte has also been much more aggressive than the other three brands when it comes to memory timings, lowering the TRC to 96 and the TWR to 48, both are significantly tighter timings than what we see from the other three, and that's why the Gaming X provided the best results of the entry level boards. That said, if we were to manually adjust these timings so that all boards were using the exact same timings and frequencies, the performance would be basically identical. So there's nothing necessarily wrong with the MSI Pro X670-P Wi-Fi, it's just not tuned as well as it could be. Now I have contacted MSI and provided them with this data, and they've assured me that these performance concerns will be addressed with their next BIOS update, 
presumably featuring the Agisa 1.0.0.4 microcode once AMD sorts out the core disabling bug that was found in that firmware version. So should MSI release a BIOS revision in the near future that's better optimized for memory performance, then the Pro X670-P Wi-Fi will certainly be worth recommending. Also ideally ASUS and ASRock will tune their boards more aggressively when using the premium CL30 DDR5 6000 memory as well, and then that would allow them to better compete with the Gigabyte Gaming X. As it stands, I feel Gigabyte has done the best job here. The X670 Gaming X is a great looking board that's loaded with features, and unlike the more expensive MSI and ASUS models, it includes a pre-installed IO shield, onboard buttons for power reset and CMOS, and that's super handy. All four M.2 slots feature cooling, and the layout here is very clean. Certainly the best designed of these entry-level boards. Then there's the performance. The Gaming X is by far the best optimized of these more affordable boards. The VRM performance was also the best, though I should note that all of these entry-level models were exceptionally good when it came to VRM thermals. The ASRock X670 EPG Lightning is also a very worthy mention, as it's the only X670 E board priced below $300 US, other than ASRock's own Pro RS, and it is the most affordable board in this roundup at $260 US, and it performed very well. It is a basic board in many respects, but given the price, I feel it's a good option, and I'll be sure to contact ASRock to see if they can better optimize their Expo settings when paired with the DDR5 6000 CL30 memory. With a little more work, the MSI Pro X670-P Wi-Fi and ASUS Prime X670-P Wi-Fi. Don't know why those boards have the same name, but they do. Uh, with a little more work, those two will be worthy contenders. But ultimately, I think it's fair to say Gigabyte does have them beat this time with the X670 Gaming X, offering a better value product that's just better all around. Now let me know what you think of these X670 boards in the comment section. Which of these would you choose? I'm very interested to uh, hear from you guys and, and see which one is the more popular one in the comment section. But that's going to do it for this one. As I said, a massive, I think it's about 20x670 motherboard roundup is coming. Hopefully I'll have that all done for you next week. The testing is done. I've just got to put it together and film it, edit and do all that fun stuff. So yeah, subscribe for that if you're interested. Also, if you'd like to support our work more directly, because a huge amount of effort goes into not only acquiring all of these boards, but doing all the b-roll, all the testing. Uh, I've been testing, took me about two months to test all 20 motherboards. It's, it's a huge undertaking. Anyway, if you want to support the work, Floatplane, Patreon, links for those are in the video description. You've got access to our exclusive Discord server, monthly live streams, Q&As, and behind the scenes content. So if you're interested, check that out. But if not, that is perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you next time.